the final years. Okay. <laughs> Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, kind of more abdominal things and then uh, a bit of hip, hip pain and genic syndromes as well, cardiology and head injuries. Um, I think the main thing I want to talk about today that you need to focus on is the kind of um, abdominal um, differentials and then what kind of investigations and treatment you do for each of those because usually the questions that I've seen in exams have been um, based around what investigation do you do for a certain set of symptoms um, so yeah just and they can be quite different in peds so with that let's start our approach to the acute abdomen so um, first history is very important as always in peds um, so um, since the child can't really tell you much um, it's important to have a look at feeding. Um, so what have they been eating exactly, especially if they're smaller children? Um, it's really important to ask about like how many grams they've been eating, how much they've been drinking as well, um, because you need to assess their hydration status. And um, if, if they're going to need anything extra, like any support. Um, and if they're vomiting. So the main thing about vomiting is you want to know um, most important thing is, is it bilious or non-bilious? So bilious vomit is green. Um, and the reason that's important is because um, if it's bilious, it usually means it's in the, at least in the duodenum that the vomit is coming from, because that's where the gallbladder releases any bile. So if it's proximal to that, so higher than that, then it won't be green. And then also ask about volume, duration, and frequency. Um, again, frequency very important. Are they going to be quite dehydrated? Are their electrolytes going to be unbalanced? Hydration status. So yeah, that involves what's going in, but also of course, um, what's going out. So exactly like how when was their last wet wet nappy? How many wet nappies have they been having? If they're a child, have they been peeing? Also, children have a high risk of getting a UTI. So if they haven't been peeing for a while, um, you might want to consider that as well. Um, bowel, just yeah, quickly ask about constipation, diarrhea. Um, if they're if the the baby if it's a baby, um, key thing to know is if they've passed meconium because there are certain syndromes like cystic fibrosis that can cause children not to pass meconium in the first twenty four hours, which is pathological. Uh, pain just as normal um infants may or children may kind of pull up their legs a lot um it's kind of a sign of colic um yeah also important to look for distension for bowel obstruction as there's different things that cause bowel obstruction in children and then in adults um okay past medical and surgical history as always um and yeah just medications okay examination what do we really want to focus on um again all about hydration status like do they look drowsy um are they behaving as usual um do they look dehydrated like is their skin quite dehydrated um is their skin mottled because that can also be a sign that their circulation isn't doing very well so possibly infection that kind of thing um, the position that can be quite important sometimes, like are they pulling their legs up a lot? We'll ex I'll explain why that's important later. And then um, actually the abdomen, um, you might need to use distraction techniques. You can always ask the parent as well to hold the, the child, which usually calms them down a bit. Um, and then in children, it's always really important to do a genital exam because um, Hernias and testicular torsion in children can be quite significant emergencies that do occur. So it's always important to rule that out. Okay. So as usual, first line investigations. I don't think I really need to go through this. I think it's kind of the same as in adults. But yeah. You might see more abdominal x-rays that are supine in children because um, obviously, they're lying down a lot of the time. Okay. 
And then in terms of imaging, what, what kind of imaging we do for the acute abdomen. So the thing about in adults, you use CTs a lot, but in children, you don't want, it's a lot of radiation to give to a child. It can significantly increase their chance of cancer, increase their chance of cancer. So we avoid it. Um, so we use things like abdominal ultrasound for appendicitis, pyloxenosis, intussusception. Um, and then for also for, well, this is a separate thing for um, kind of like upper GI um, blockages or caused by, for example, something called malrotation or volvulus. You'll do an upper GI contrast study. And then also for intersusception, you can do an air enema, which is both uh, therapeutic and diagnostic. And then a Meckel scan specifically for Meckel's diverticulum. Okay. So I'm going to move on to some questions now. Uh, did you say that? Oh, okay, you have a poll. Go ahead and fill that out when you're ready. I don't think I get the answers from the poll. Do I for you? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Once I end it, I'll show the answers to everyone. So it's fine. Okay. I'll just wait a second. No. Oh, okay. Great. So it seems you guys are on the right track. Um, so a six year old, six six hour old infant presents a bilious vomiting. 36 weeks gestation and 2.6 kilometers, uh, kilograms, sorry, um, and normal APGAR score, which is not part of your differentials. So I think the key thing here to note is that um, they have bilious vomiting. So like we said, bilious vomiting is only really for if there's a pathology in the starting at the duodenum um, and the esophagus is, of, of course, above that. So you'd really have non-bilious vomit with that. So um, droppy white vomit with saliva and mucus for esophageal atresia. Um, let me know if you have any questions about that, although you all seem to get the right answer. So that's fine. Yeah, again, yeah, just very important to recognize bile stain vomit usually requires some sort of surgical input. And then... Yeah, non bilious vomit is more medical, except for pyloric stenosis, which we're going to talk about as well. Here's another question. I'll give you some time because it's a long, long little blurb. Okay, great. Fifty percent metabolic acidosis and fifty percent aciduria. Okay, um, so uh, the question is trying to quick you, trying to trick you a bit. Um, but the answer is aciduria. I'm gonna run through that a bit. Um, so actually, the classic thing you get in exams a lot is. Um, a hypokalemic, hypochloremic, and uh, metabolic al alkalosis with paradoxical acidurium. Um, and yeah, it can sometimes be hypernatremia as well. They probably wouldn't ask that in an exam anyway. So the hypochloremic is because um, when they're vomiting in pyloric stenosis, they vomit HCl, so they vomit the acid and they vomit chloride, so hypochloremia, then metabolic alkalosis, because again, they're vomiting um, 
they're vomiting hydro um HCl hydrochloric acid um and then the the thing the reason it's it can cause paradoxical aciduria um don't worry about knowing this in too much detail really but I guess for interest I'll just explain it so um when when usually in normal physiology um bicarbonate secreted by the parietal cells to kind of make sure that the pH doesn't get too too low in the stomach but in um pyloric stenosis the pa patient or when when any time the patient is vomiting um they'll vomit um hcl and so instead of kind of secreting the bicarbonate into the stomach it'll go inside into the blood which will make the blood a bit alkalonic and then um I'm sorry. And then that's why you get metabolic alkalosis. And at first you um, try to pee out this um, bicarbonate or well, this alkalotic um, blood by, um, by pumping out bicarbonate. And so you have alkaline urine. Um, but then later on you can get aciduria. Um, and that's basically to do with potassium because um, the longer it goes on, the more you also lose potassium through vomiting. And then um, that kind of act activates the renin angiotensin system. Um, and that causes your kidneys kind of to save potassium by pumping out um, hydrogen. Um, and then um, because of that, you'll get an aciduria because the hydrogen is being pumped into your urine. Um, I know it's quite a long story. You don't really need to do it in that much detail, but for interest, that's why. And then, um, of course, sodium is also lost by vomiting. But sometimes um, you can get hypernatremia because um, your kidneys try to reabsorb um, the sodium after it losing it after a while. Okay. Um, so now I'll just go a bit further into pyloric stenosis. Um, so the key things to know in a question, it usually be for an infant around six weeks, most often male. Um, there are some risk factors like maternal smoking, bottle feeding, viral infection genetics. So it's more common in people who have a family history or an older sibling that's had it. Um, basically what, what it is, is the sphincter between the stomach and the duodenum is tighter than usual. And that's why you get these symptoms of when a baby eats, it'll be about half an hour after they eat, the milk will try to pass from the stomach to the duodenum. And then it can't because the sphincter is too tight. And that's when the baby throws up like projectile vomit because it's coming all the way from the sphincter and the sphincter kind of contracts and causes this projectile vomiting. Um, sometimes if you, you, you feel the baby's abdomen, you might feel kind of a palpable olive shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. Um, and you can also see kind of a visible peristalsis over the stomach, which is kind of classic. Um, the other key thing to note is that the babies will often be very dehydrated because um, it might be a while before they actually present to the doctor because um, babies do a lot of vomits anyway. So by the time they present, they might be quite dehydrated. Um, so it's really important to uh, treat the dehydration first because they can't go into surgery dehydrated. They also might have failure to thrive and weight loss because they obviously can't get any food in. Um, yeah. And usually for the rest, they'll be kind of just a hungry, well, infant. Okay. So bloods, you want to do full blood count, um, white cell count, CRP. Uh, using these for the, to look for the hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis and VBG as well. Um, and then the first line and definitive diagnosis is going to be ultrasound of the abdomen. Um, where you, where you, you'll see a thickened sphincter 
um, usually around more than four millimeters is diagnostic. Um, if an abdominal x-ray is done, although it's not really the first line investigation, you'd see a gastric bubble, possibly. And if you do a barium meal, um, string sign with shouldering, cervix, triple track, and mushroom sign. But really just remember the ultrasound abdomen. And then management, first, always first aid to E assessment and fluid resuscitation. Um, and then also correct any electrolyte imbalances. And then definitive management is a Ramsted or laparoscopic pyloromyotomy. Okay. And basically, yeah, that's just like they go in um, laparoscopically and from the bottom, they cut open the outside of the pylorus to loosen the sphincter. But... Okay. So now we're going to move on to causes of bilious vomiting. It's really good to think of these as kind of very early, like in the newborn period, um, in the infant period, or just generally in children. Okay, so in the newborn period, we can have necrotizing enterocolitis, which is kind of a kind of severe infection. Babies um, often it starts already like when they're when they're born immediately, and they'll be very unwell. Um, so it's really important to watch out for that. Um, I think someone else is going to go and talk, Vishal is going to talk about it a bit later as well in more detail. Um, Hirschsprung's disease, again, going to be talked about later, I think. Um, meconium ileus, that's when you, you can get in cystic fibrosis, where meconium, basically the, the meconium doesn't pass in the first 24 hours or is delayed um, because um, it's basically kind of stuck um, because of cystic fibrosis and then malrotation as well can occur usually in the first three to seven days so not immediately um, then you've got hernias in infants can occur um, intussusception which is kind of um, when the bowel kind of folds into itself and that causes a bowel obstruction itself it's usually caused um by something else um, because it usually needs to, um, usually when the, the bowel folds in on itself, there needs to be something that, call, that that gets it stuck. So for example, you can have something called Peyer's patches, which are kind of lymph nodes that you have, um, excess lymph nodes that you have in the abdomen as a child and the bowel can get stuck and then fold in on itself. Um, or it could be caused by a Meckel's diverticulum, which is kind of a two centimeter, um, a, it's kind of like a duct two centimeters from the ileocecal valve that can sometimes be a remnant from, from the embryo. And usually it disappears in the womb, but some, ba some babies do still have it after. So there's this rule of two, twos, 2% 2 of the population, um, yeah, and then two feet from the ileocecal west, two feet, I think it's from the ileocecal valve, sorry. Um, yeah, and then in children, appendicitis is quite common. Um, and then you can just have other things like an adult, like hernia, cholecystitis, and pancreatitis. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. Great. So a baby with bilious vomiting past meconium in the first 24 hours has mild abdominal distension. The abdomen is soft, no obvious abdominal tenderness, currently eight days old, 
and positive, so little air in the abdominal x-ray. Positive air in the abdominal x-ray. Okay, what is the most urgent investigation you want to order? So um, the answer is actually C. I think some of you said D. Um, so like I said earlier, um, we don't really do CTs in children because of the risk of cancer. Um, so you can almost always rule that out um, in those kind of questions. Uh, yeah, so the gold standard for malrotation, which is, is, is an upper GI barium study. Um, so what kind of points you to malrotation? So first of all, it's bilious vomiting. Uh, just first, I'm going to just explain what malrotation is actually. So malrotation can be caused um, when there's kind of em embryological remains um, that the gut gets twisted up in. And so often when the, when the gut gets twisted, it completely blocks the flow of any um, feces or anything through it. And then um, you get bowel obstruction as well. And that's kind of one of the causes of bowel obstruction, of small bowel obstruction in children. So usually with upper GI things, you wanna do an upper GI barium study. Um, so bilious vomit, so that gives you a sign that it's a, it's a kind of duodenal issue. Um, they pass meconium, so it's probably not kind of like a necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, it's probably not um, meconium ileus. They have abdominal distension, so that's kind of a sign of a bowel obstruction. Um, and eight days old is like like I said, malrotation usually occurs from three to seven days. So. The age is really important in abdominal differentials. Okay. Um, and it's really important to recognize this condition because um, it can it can have a really bad prognosis if it's not recognized early. Okay. Malrotation with mid-gut volvulus. So Malrotation is just kind of um, the the broad term we give for rotate for the rotating um, um, abnormality, but it can be caused by different things. Um, so it could be caused by kind of duodenal atresia or other things causing a twisting of the bowel. Um, yeah, it's very time critical. So what can happen if if it's not solved quickly is that it can actually necrose the bowel and the baby can get short gut syndrome. Uh, clinical features are, so bilious vomiting, abdominal pain. Um, it doesn't present with a lot of abdominal signs until late stages. And then another classic thing is the baby pulling up their legs. Um, and usually they cry a lot with malrotation. So the crying is often relieved by the by the baby pulling up their legs. Yeah, okay. And then sometimes actually, um, so usually it presents in infants, but sometimes it can pre present later on. Um, so in infant preschool age, um, and then you might get more, you might still get bilious vomiting, but also failure to thrive and intermittent abdominal pain. And that's kind of caused because the bowel keeps twisting and untwisting. So it's not constant. And then investigations, yeah, just your standard investigations, full blood count. Um, white cell count is usually elevated in volvulus. Dehydration, omnis and E's, um, BBG and ABG to look at lactate as well. The raised lactate is quite serious. Um, and then you might want to do a group and save and cross match because they might need surgery. So yeah, the diagnostic test is an upper GI contrast series, and you'll see a corkscrew sign, which you can see here. Um, and on X X ray, you might see a double bubble sign. Okay, uh, management. It's kind of it's quite urgent, so you want to call get the surgical team involved urgently. In the meantime, you do like any other bowel obstruction, drip and suck and prophylactic ant antibiotics. Um, and if they're very ill, you do an emergency laparotomy 
and lad procedure but if not then the definitive procedure is still um a lad's procedure okay um and then last before we move on just wanted to mention some other differentials that you want, might want to consider um with kind of vomiting or abdo pain symptoms so other things you can get are these cow's milk protein intolerance or allergy so that's usually in young infants and presents they usually have it before three months of age um, and there'll be a lot of drawing up their knees and crying they'll have milky vomits um, a failure to thrive and they might have allergic symptoms like urticaria or wheeze or something like that um, oh, I said a failure to thrive twice <laughs> um, mesenteric adenitis which is quite a common thing in children where they basically have lymph nodes in their abdomen that can get inflamed after a viral illness and it can cause kind of a pain mimicking appendicitis. So that's another differential to look out for. They usually won't actually be very unwell though. So that's how you kind of differentiate it from anything more serious. Um, primary constipation. So remember constipation is actually very common in children. Um, and usually, so usually the constipation is relieved by passing stool. There might be kind of a diet thing related or a stress um sign of stress um so in, any kind of those social issues um you might want to consider just primary constipation um GERD so GERD can happen in infants a lot um it's very common cause of vomiting and usually the vomiting is milky feeds very soon after feeds um and especially when they're lying flat and the treatment's actually just um, kind of giving them a thicker formula, like an alginate formula. Okay. Uh, and then gastroenteritis, of course, can also cause diarrhea and vomiting. They might have fever, signs of being kind of unwell or septic um, and dehydration. So it's always assessed the dehydration status. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far? And if not, um, please fill out the feedback form as well. That'd be great. And then I'll pass it over to Vishal. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, all right. So now we're going to move on to sort of the, the next part of the sort of pediatric abdomen um, slides that we're going to cover. So this slide um, just covers upper GI and lower GI bleeding differentials. A lot of them overlap with things you would have learned in fourth year. Um, the particular ones I think to be aware of um, are the quite big conditions that are often assessed in exams. So uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is a very important cause of lower GI bleeding in neonates, which is something we're going to cover later. And it's essentially bowel ischemia with a superimposed infection. Um, and it's very common in premature newborns. Um, other ones to be aware of are malrotation and Hirschsprung's disease, which can cause ischemia and lower GI bleeding. Um, and hemorrhagic disease of the newborn is a very rare cause of lower GI bleeding, which is quite uncommon because it's prevented by giving vitamin K. Um, directly after. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, so um, this is something that you guys can read in your own time, but uh, that's essentially for neonatal bleeding. Um, but we'll just move on quickly to the history because I feel like that's something you guys can read in your own time as well. Um, okay, right. Um, again, with the history and the examination. Um, again, the highlighted parts are most important. Um, a lot of this, again, overlaps with fourth year. The key thing, I think, from here as well is to look for signs of child abuse, so non-accidental injury. Again, that's something quite unique. Um, but, yeah, so, again, because this is 
it'll make the thing quite long. So we'll, we'll skip that part and just go straight to the acute abdomen. Um, so yeah, necrotizing enterocolitis. So this is a key condition to know about in pediatrics. Um, so essentially what's going on is you've got necrosis of the bowel, like I said, with the infection. Um, and a key way that it can be diagnosed is actually in contrast to what Marit was saying, you can do an ab abdominal x-ray in neonates and you see a classic sign, which is pneumatosis intestinal analis, which is a sign of essentially perforation of the bowel causing air in the extra luminal space. And you can see that on an abdominal x-ray. Um, but again, that's more for academic things and also for exam questions. It's actually very rarely done in clinical practice. Um, but the key things to know with necrotizing enterocolitis is that they need to be treated with bowel rest. Um, so sometimes they'll be given um, feeding through a, an NG tube, but they'll be very carefully fed and um, they'll have to be slowly introduced to feeds following birth. Um, uh, these are the, some of the risk factors that can um, essentially predispose to necrotizing enterocolitis as well. Um, so a very low birth weight. Um, so you can see the incidence is much higher in very low birth weight um, and hypertension. So there's hypertension immediately after birth and then neonatal sepsis as well as another key one to be aware of. Um, and then these are iatrogenic causes of bleeding in general. So treatment of the patent ductus arteriosus with an ibuprofen, which you remember is an NSAID, can cause bleeding. So that's an important differential in when you're trying to decide if it's necrotizing enterocolitis or bleeding from another cause. Um, so uh, these are, again, the key signs that you get in necrotizing enterocolitis. So bloody stool, um, intolerance to feeding, vomiting. There'll be signs of systemic, they'll be systemically unwell. So they'll be lethargic, tachycardic, febrile, pyrexic. Um, and then a late sign is if they start presenting with apnea, so respiratory symptoms with desaturation and systemic hypotension. So they start getting sepsis from the infection. Um, this is how we work up a, a baby that, we suspect might have necrotizing enterocolitis. So we'll do our bloods. So again, looking for infective markers, FBC, CRP cultures to guide our antibiotic treatment, um, an ABG to decide how systemically unwell the baby might be, um, or in, in, often a capillary blood glucose is used instead of an arterial blood gas in um, young children, a coagulation profile, um, and you do abdominal x-rays, and then a group and save in case they need surgery. So often um, patients with necrotizing colitis might need um, bowel resection if part of the affected bowel is not, say, is not salvageable, essentially. Um, and then you'd see these typical signs. Um, so instead of a, a neutrophilia, you'll get a neutropenia um, in necrotizing enterocolitis in children. And the leukocytosis, hyponatremia, metabolic acidosis, again, similar to sepsis. Um, and then they can get um, disseminated intravascular intra intracoagulation, disseminated intravascular coagulation in severe neck as well. And then this is that classic sign, pneumatosis intestinal alis, which is pathognomic for neck, as well as um, um, gas in the portal venous system. Uh, and that's how we manage them. Um, so this is the key thing to be aware of, the low threshold for surgery. So they might need an emergency laparotomy, particularly if there's perforation of the bowel but essentially they're gonna need gut rest, fluid resuscitation and IV antibiotics. Um, so just know those key principles and the exact details of what antibiotics are used is kind of beyond what you might be expected to know. You just need to know it's a key part of the management. Um, and they'll be managed typically in a intensive care setting. So in a neonatal intensive care unit um, with continuous blood pressure monitoring. Um, and then you know, we regularly observed by a specialist neonatal pediatrician. Um, it is quite a particularly dangerous condition. I mean, it's mortality of 20 to 40% with many complications. So again, complications from damage to the bowel itself. So um, stenosis and strictures, but also that's particularly if they've required surgery, they can get short gut syndrome with essentially because the part of the gut is gone, you get sort of very fast transit of gut contents um, and you get malabsorption as well. So they can present with failure to thrive. Um, and there's a significant chance of neurodevelopmental delay as well. Um, this is quite a niche, um, this part. Um, and a lot, again, a lot of this overlaps with fourth year knowledge, but um, these are generally two slides to know about the key renal emergencies. 
which not just in pediatrics, but also in adults, which is hypertensive encephalopathy and hyperkalemia. And the treatments are, again, similar to what they are in adults. So you'd use labetalol or sodium nitroprusside or GTN um, to lower blood pressure, um, particularly in hypertensive encephalopathy. Um, and one of the key symptoms in pediatrics that can cause this is co-optation of aorta, which is narrowing of the abdominal aorta. And so to compensate for this, um, the body tries to raise the blood pressure to potentially dangerous levels um, to deal with the fact that part of the aorta is narrowed. Um, and that um, you can also get raised ICP. So this is a classic Cushing's reflex. So in raised ICP, you get um, hypertension and bradycardia and a widened pulse pressure. That's the classic triad of Cushing's triad. And raised ICP can happen in children because of hydrocephalus. So this could be because of impaired cerebrospinal fluid drainage. So that could be a narrowing of the um, well, in ventricular megaly because of, there's nowhere for the cerebrospinal fluid to go. Um, and it can also be because of um, space occupying lesion in the brain, um, such as a brain abscess or brain tumor. So top posterior foster tumors are very common in children. Things like medulloblastoma are very common in children. So there's a kind of bimodal distribution in brain cancer, and you kind of see this very sharp increase in children with brain malignancy. Um, so that's why raised ICP is a key presentation in pediatrics. Um, and then you'd obviously treat the underlying cause of hypertension. In hyperkalemia, um, again, what you'd want to do is you'd... Um, stop any infusions of potassium, particularly potassium added to IV fluid bags. Um, you can give risonium, which will help the excretion of potassium from the body, and then use uh, insulin dextrose solution and nebulized salbutamol um, to essentially drive potassium into cells, and again, outside of the extracellular space, because the main thing we worry about with hyperkalemia is um, cardiac arrhythmias. And again, we can give IV calcium chloride or calcium gluconate to stabilize the cardiac membrane to reduce the chance of a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. Um, and then IV sodium bicarbonate is part of the management too, but again, quite niche. And then hemodialysis for refractory hyperkalemia. So there are the key things to be to know for the indications for hemodialysis, one of which is electrolyte flow derangement, so refractory hyperkalemia, as well as things like refractory pulmonary edema, metabolic acidosis that again can't, is not responding to medical treatment um, and so on. So it's good to be aware of a few of it. Um, and then that's the uh, end of my section. Um, sorry, Vishal, I think, I don't know how this happened, but there's a section just missing from your bit. It's like about inguinal hernias and um, interception. Uh, here we go. Yeah, this bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could just cover that bit, if you don't mind, like from inguinal hernia. I yeah, don't know what happened. It's sorry. Quite, yeah, yeah. I think there must have been some mistake. All right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no worries. Um, so um, in, this slide on inguinal hernias is quite important because uh, remember, you'd be used to inguinal hernias in elderly men is the typical presentation, but there's also uh, a presentation within young boys as well. Um, and it's more common in premature babies, and it presents as a lump in the groin, classically superior and medial to the pubic tubercle. Um, and they're typically reducible. If they're non-reducible, we call them incarcerated inguinal hernias, and they can present with colicky pain and distension and signs of obstruction, so bilious vomit and constipation too. Um, a differential diagnosis for when you see any lump in the groin is that it could actually, in boys, it could be an undescended testicle, and then that can also predispose them to torsion. Interestingly, not just torsion in the undescended testicle, but also in the contralateral testicle too. Um, it could also be a hydrocele, so um, I don't know if you guys will have covered urology, but hydrocele is an abnormal collection of fluid, um, which can present as a, a swelling of the scrotum, which can ascend up and then present as a swelling in the groin. Um, and then hernias in females can often be because of the ovaries. So sort of instead of it being a hernia, it could be an enlarged ovary. Um, and typically it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, the key things to know about a management are, is, are that if it's incarcerated, they need to be sent for emergency surgery. If it's not incarcerated, it can be repaired electively. And depending on the age, it will depend on the urgency of how often, how, how quickly you need to send them for surgery. So a good rule here is the younger than six days, which is it's very uncommon that someone will present with a hernia that early. They need surgery within two days and within six months, two weeks. And if they get less than six years, within two months. Um, and 
you have to be careful reducing, trying to reduce the hernia yourself. It's often better to have a senior pediatrician involved or a senior surgeon. Um, so we'll just start with this question as well. Um, so a seven month year old presents with a two hour history of bilious vomiting and irritability with no fever. What is the most likely diagnosis? Anyone got any ideas? Just put a poll up. So we'll move on in the interest of time, but the answer in this case is intersusception, which I can see most of you put, which is good. Um, so this is um, a key presentation we will have bilious vomiting and Marit covered a few of the key conditions um, that are options here. Um, but the reason that intersusception is the most likely in this case, and it can be quite difficult to tell, I know someone put maritation, which wouldn't blame you for putting because there is bilious vomiting in an acute setting. Um, but interception is the mo more common, firstly, the maritation. And it's the intermittent irritability that is the key clue as well, because um, as we go on to talk about, interception presents with this intermittent colicky type pain. So 20 minute periods of crying and drawing up of the legs that self-resolve, but come back um, and typically get worse as it goes on in them as well. Um, and seven months is a typical age when you'd expect interception to happen. So this is a, a key condition to be aware of in pediatrics. So what happens in interception is that the bowel telescopes into itself, which this diagram shows quite well. And it can sometimes just happen without any identifiable cause, but sometimes it happens secondary to another condition, which is what the lead point is referring to. So a lead point just refers to an enlargement or abnormality in the bowel, which then enables this telescoping to happen. So um, sometimes it can happen secondary to a gastroenteritis infection. So remember, rotavirus is a very common cause of gastroenteritis in children, um, as well as enteroviruses as well. And a lead point refers to things like a Meckel's diverticulum, an abnormal polyp, a lymphoma, um, enlargement of the bowel from a large mass as well, and cystic fibrosis and HSP2. And the interesting COVID lymphadenopathy. So remember, we're talking about mesenteric adenitis. So that's um, enlargement of the lymph nodes in the abdomen causing pain. So those lymph nodes can act as a lead point for intersusception to happen. Um, and then classically it presents within five to 10 months, but in theory it can happen anywhere up to five years old. Um, and the reason it can be fatal is when it's poorly, well, it's, there's a failure to diagnose it in time. Um, so one of the classic signs that you learn about in exams is this red current jelly stool. But the reason that's a late finding is because it actually represents necrosis of the bowel. So um, by the time that this has happened, you know that the child will have to have some form of surgery because part of their bowel has died. Um, so that's that's something you want to avoid happening. You don't want to see the sign because it means that it's, you've waited too long to diagnose it. Um, and yeah, it can commonly be called, um, happen at the ileocecal valve where the proximal portion of the bowel is drawn into the distal and it is slightly more common in males too. Um, but yeah, the classic things to be aware of, the intermittent colicky pain, the bilious vomiting, red current jelly stool, and sometimes the drawing up of the legs too. And then they can present with some non-specific neurological signs too, like lethargy, shock, seizures, and apneas. Um, and then you can classically get this sausage-shaped right upper quadrant mass, um, which is what you might expect if it's the ileocecal valve and then the proximal portion, portion of the bowel that's involved. Um, and it's rarely you get this dance sign, which is an absence of bowel in the right lower quadrant because of the fact that that part of the bowel is telescoped up to the proximal portion. Um, so another thing to be aware of is that if there's a circulatory collapse or prodromal fever, it can lead people to believe that it's just a case of, of sepsis, but it might actually be intersusception. Um, Again, the red current stools, colic and drawing up the legs, it's not specific. So remember that can be somewhat a way that intestinal malrotation could present to. An ultrasound is very sensitive and you get this target sign, which we'll see later. Um, and you can do a contrast enema as well, 
to help diagnose it, but that's contraindicated if there's any signs of peritonitis, so that's guarding or rigidity um, or perforation or shock. Uh, you'd resusc fluid resuscitate them, decompress the bowel, give antibiotics to cover for any infection, and you can manage them with air insulation, which is essentially where you, you push, you pump air through the anus and it helps decompress the bowel and relieve the telescoping. Um, but often it can recur as well without surgery. Uh, so this is the classic sign you see, um, to look like a donut because you've got two portions of bowel within each other. And then this is the other key thing to be aware of in pediatrics, which is appendicitis. Um, so appendicitis can present from any age potentially, but classically it's above the age of five and you get the um, periumbilical pain initially, which then um, moves to the right iliac fossa, low-grade fever, anorexia, dysuria, and tachycardia. Um, and within two to five, it is much more difficult to diagnose because the symptoms are very nonspecific and just present like a gastroenteritis. And sometimes you can get a high-grade fever, um, you can get localized infective symptoms like perforation, abscesses, and elevated white cells in CRP. So it's not very obvious that it's appendicitis until they take them for surgery and then they can see. Um, and then a perforated appendix from laparotomy. Um, that can happen because of an undeveloped momentum, so they can get generalized peritonitis from the perforation. Um, and then these are other risk factors for developing appendicitis and immunocompromised following COVID infection and premature infants. Um, yeah, so it's the most common surgical emergency in children, and it's one of the most common in adults as well. Um, and it's largely a clinical diagnosis. Um, this is a classic sign that you can elicit. So in a retrochecal appendix, if you ask them to hop on their right leg, they won't be able to because of irritation of the psoas muscle. Um, you can do an ultrasound, which will help well, rule out any other potential diagnoses. So rule out torsion in the case of males or ovarian torsion in females as well. Um, there isn't much use to doing a blood or an x-ray because you might get a ray CRP or white cells, but they're not specific for appendicitis. Um, and we rarely can't do CTs in children as Marek covered. Um, and then you can look for other potential viral infections, which might have um, predisposed, happened earlier prior to the appendicitis and might have led to the development of it, or be a differential for a viral gastroenteritis following an infection. Um, management, fluid resuscitation, decompression, antibiotics. Um, and sometimes it's better to delay the surgery, but eventually they are gonna need an appendectomy um, and you can give them IV antibiotics prior to surgery, which is known to improve outcomes as well. Um, so often it's a difficult diagnosis of appendicitis because it can be confused with gastroenteritis. Um, I mean, again, a lot of these symptoms overlap. So abdominal pain and fever and diarrhea, you might get in gastroenteritis. And another differential is UTI. Um, so because of the irritation in the appendix, it can irritate the bladder and cause um, well, UTI-like symptoms. You can get an hematuria and you can get raised white cells in the urine and you can get the development of a localized pelvic abscess, which can cause tenderness. Um, and then again, Meckel's diverticulum in under two-year-olds can be a key differential like appendicitis as well. Um, and then paralytic ileus is, sniff is a lot rarer. So this is, Perhaps, I mean, that's less important to be aware of, but um, often it's preceded by a gastroenteritis infection um, and giving antispasmodic medication, which is typ might typically be done for like, IBS type symptoms, um, can often exacerbate the paralytic ileus. Um, and what you often see in a paralytic ileus is a distended with, um, abdomen with generalized tenderness because it's an obstruction. It's a functional obstruction. So there's nothing particularly blocking the bowel apart from the fact that it's not able to um, peristalsis, it's not able to perform peristalsis. Um, and you can get generalized small bowel, large bowel distension on the abdominal x-ray. Um, and you, you kind of have to differentiate it from an intestinal obstruction that might have a, an organic cause, so, such as an appendicitis that's perforated or a mass or a stricture in the abdomen. Um, and then you manage that with gut rest and a flatus tube, which is a tube that's inserted through the anus to help drain any of the bowel contents to decompress the colon and reduce the risk of perforation. Um, these are some quick notes on pancreatitis and cholecystitis, um, which again are quite rare in children, but in dairy can still happen. 
So a cholecystitis referring to an infection of the gallbladder, which is more common in women, and some of the key um, causes of pancreatitis. The key ones to be aware of are gallstones and ethanol, which are responsible for about 90% of pancreatitis. And rarely you get all the other causes, such as trauma, steroids, autoimmune, and then drugs as well, like protramoxacil and chemotherapy. Um, and then we've covered this part. So that is the end of my bit then. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you'd send some feedback, that'd be great. And then I'll hand over to Freya to do the last part. But thanks. I'll just let you guys do the feedback. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen now. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Okay, I hope you can anyway. Okay, so I'm just going to speak firstly about endocrine emergencies. So um, there are three main things, three main types of endocrine emergencies you kind of want to think about. Uh, the first being um, hyperglycemia, um, when your glucose is obviously too low. And then the second being um, when your glucose is too high and it can manifest as DKA. And then the last one um, being um, an adrenal crisis when you kind of have like a steroid mishap. Um, so if we first speak about hyperglycemia, now the, the actual like value of glucose can vary. So some sources say glucose less than four, some say like less than 3.3. This one says less than 2.2, um, but it's between those numbers. Uh, you don't need to like hyper fixate on it. It's not like an important thing, um, but it normally presents as like comatose signs. So there could be like confusion, dizziness, weakness, um, uh, nausea, vomiting. And um, some of the investigations you'd want to do are to send for urine first. Um, so you're looking for ketones in the in the urine. You can also do bloods looking at insulin and more directly looking at C-peptide because C-peptide is released with insulin in most cases. Um, so you can see if this is an issue with too much insulin being secreted somewhere or is, is it an issue with something else that's causing it? Um, and the reason you could sometimes do like cortisol and growth hormone as well, um, you'd look for values for that in the blood is because they're associated with glucose. So high levels of cortisol normally indicate high levels of glucose. And if there are low levels of cortisol or aldosterone, for example, in the case of something like Addison's disease, that would mean that there is, it can often manifest as hyperglycemia as one of its first presentations. So always keep that in the back of your mind. Um, now, in some cases, so obviously, if you're like a diabetic, you would regularly be monitoring your glucose levels. And in some cases, your glucose value may be lower um, than normal for you, but you may actually be asymptomatic. So in cases like this, it's normally advised that you have like a glucose drink between 10 to 20 grams of glucose, followed by food. Um, if you are symptomatic, however, you've normally come in with like really bad signs, um, like the ones I said earlier. And you'd probably need like an IV drip of glucose. Um, again, this kind of varies um, from place to place and from how severe the hyperglycemia is. So you would never be expected to kind of figure out what to do. Um, so don't worry. Um, but something that's important to remember is to monitor the glucose um, between every half an hour to every hour. And you'd also, I guess, for like refractory cases where glucose is still not reducing, um, it's still not increasing, sorry, you can give things like glucagon um, to help inc increase the um, glucose. And then now looking at DK, this is probably the most important one you need to learn out of all of these three. Um, it, can, it's, it can come up in OSCEs, it can come up in like as an ACE, and it can also come up as um, SBA. So just keep that in mind. And um, 
one of the most so obviously the way it normally presents is through um hyperglycemia so when your glucose is too high and you can also have ketones in your blood and this eventually causes like an acidic picture in your blood to happen um so in order to fix it um you would want to correct the dehydration over 48 hours so we'll talk a little bit about how to correct dehydration because i think it's really hard um, like fluids are hard anyway but when you are talking about maintenance fluids and also like correct like de like rehydration fluids it gets really confusing um, so we can go through that later and then the way to kind of fix DKA is to give IV insulin again this changes on from place to place um, but just make sure you remember to give potassium if you're like prescribing this in like an A2E alongside your insulin because um, insulin causes hypokalemia. Um, so that's why we need to supplement with potassium. And you also need to correct whatever you're doing really slowly um, because if you add too much fluid all in one go, because all these patients with DKA are essentially very dehydrated. And if you correct any dehydration really quickly, um, what it what it means is that when someone's dehydrated in their blood, they don't have a lot of water in their blood, obviously. Um, so the concentration of all your other like electrolytes would kind of be higher relatively. Um, so that means that when you are hydrating someone with lots of water, that's going to spike quite quickly if you're doing it over a really short space of time, which is why we say we need to correct the dehydration over 48 hours because if you do this over a short space of time there's going to be a really sharp like concentration difference between the um concentration of water for example in the blood compared to outside and what it will essentially do is it will cause water to shift from inside to outside because the inside of the blood will be quite um concentrated with other electrolytes and then it will just quickly shift outside. So essentially, you're trying to help this patient who's dehydrated by giving them more water. Um, but all that water is doing is going straight from the blood and into um, surrounding spaces. And this is really problematic in the brain because it can cause cerebral edema, which is um, a big concern. So you want to avoid that. And you can monitor for cerebral edema normally using one-to-one -one nurses. They'll be looking for like neuro signs and um, looking at their GCS and stuff like that. But you really wanna avoid that. And then adrenal crisis. I normally remember this as like um, Addison's disease on steroids because it is kind of about steroids. Um, so in Addison's disease, you don't have um, as much aldosterone because the body is kind of attacking the aldosterone. And what aldosterone does is it causes the reabsorption of sodium into the body and it increases um, potassium. So if you have um, less aldosterone, that would mean that you would have low sodium and higher potassium, which is often how an adrenal crisis can present. Um, and like I said before, Addison's is associated with low glucose as well because of all the other hormones um, it kind of influences. And that's why you can also have hypoglycemia. So adrenal crisis and hypoglycemia kind of go hand in hand. Um, and you can also have other signs of shock. So this is obviously like a really big emer emergency and you'd want to resuscitate them. Normally this is done with like IV hydrocortisone because you're not, you're trying to supplement um, the steroids that they don't really have. Um, and it can be triggered by like a cough, a cold, surgery. It can be triggered by a range of things um, because in all these circumstances, the body needs more um, steroids than it actually get is having. And because it's not having those, it goes through the symptoms of like an adrenal crisis. Um, therefore, you need to give them steroids and in, in quite a lot of them. Um, so normally the patient is given IV hydrocortisone. They're always admitted and are sometimes oral fruit. That's felt wrong, but fruit cortisone may be given afterwards as well um, to uh, buffer their period until they get normal, basically. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to talk, like just ask. There's only a few of you left anyway. Um, so this, the next few slides are really just for your own reference. I'm not really gonna bother going through them properly, but these are like colored, like color coded. So if it's red, it means there's like a high incidence in this population. So it's based on ages. So it's just a summary of all the kind of abdo conditions that can come up. As you can see, honestly, I learned 
I, I learned like pediatric gastro or any abdo presentations with the age of onset because some of those things I'm just like the symptoms overlap so much and it's a bit it's a bit confusing sometimes so I think learning it by age is quite easy to like um, categorize them and then you can think about okay if they're an infant it's really between these two things and then you can think about like okay so what differentiates intersusception and malrotation and then you can hopefully it can guide your answers a bit better so yeah, you can use these at the end when you get the slides. Okay, so talking about fluid therapy in children. So um, fluids are notoriously a bit annoying to do and they're not very well taught. So I'll try my best. So if you have any questions, just let me know. But a standard fluid bolus is normally about 20 milliliters um, per kilogram of 0.9% sodium chloride over less than 10 minutes. So it's kind of similar to the adult one, but it's not exactly the same. And um, you should be using small fluid boluses um, of about 10 milliliters per kilogram if the baby's basically small. So if they're a neonate or if you need to correct whatever issue has happened really slowly because you're worried about things like cerebral edema, like in the case of DKA that I already explained, then you'd be using like a lower, um, like a small, like a, sh uh, a shallower um, rate basically. And if the child is in shock, you don't subtract like the resus fluids that you've used from their maintenance fluids. So anytime a child comes in and they need fluids of any sort, based on their weight, fluids are calculated, which we'll go through in the next slide. Um, if they are in shock and they've needed resus fluids, that means that they need more than their maintenance because something's happened to them. So don't subtract your resus fluids from the maintenance and then prescribe and then like prescribe the remaining maintenance fluids for them they will still need their baseline of maintenance because they've been clinically dehydrated and they are like very ill so just remember that okay so the way it's calculated is to be fair fluids given via iv is kind of only reserved for kids who are not drinking um enough because they're vomiting or because they're nil by mouth for some reason um, and the way it's calculated, I think it's a bit easier to remember than adults because adults to me is just like a bit like a guessing game. Um, I still don't properly get it, but in kids, there's like a set rule. So it's based on their weight and it splits up. So the first 10 kg of a kid's weight, you're using the rate of giving them fluids 100 milliliters per kilogram per day. And then the next 10 kg um, would be 50 milliliters per kilogram per day. And then the remainder of the body weight. So anything that's 20 kg plus will be 20 milliliters per kilogram per, per kilogram per day. And then you add all those up and then you get a total amount of fluid you need to give them in 24 hours. And then you divide the total amount by 24 to get like a rate of milliliters per hours. Um, so, yeah, I like I already said before, in cases of like where there are electrolyte issues, then replace fluid slowly because of cerebral edema. And um, normally in kids, if the fluid is like 0.9% saline, then it's usually given with dextrose. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, and the user needs need to be closely monitored because of all these cerebral edema issues. And um, usually it's given in like 500 milliliter bags. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because you go through all these calculations to calculate the exact amount of fluid they will need. And in most cases, you'll have to either round up or round down because bags are usually just given in 500 milliliters. So you're not gonna be giving like 10 millimeter like injections to make it exact on the dot, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, just remember that. So for example, um, would any of you like to just like calculate how much a 10 kg, 27 kg child would need or should we just go through it? If none of you say anything, I'll just go for it in the next like two seconds. Okay, fine. Um, so to calculate their total daily requirement. So like I said before, the first 10 kg is 100 milliliters per kilogram. So that's 10 times 10, giving you a thousand. So that's fine. You've got the first 10 kg sorted. You need a liter for that. The next 10 kg you need, it's the rate is 50 milliliters per kilo. So that's 50 times 10, which is 500 milliliters. So great for the first 20 kg, 1.5 liters sorted. And the remaining seven kg, 
this is um, 20 milliliters per kilogram per day. So that's 20 times seven because what you have left after you've done 20 kgs from 27 is seven kilograms. And that's 140 milliliters. So if you add all of these together, you would get that total. And that's the amount of maintenance fluids they'll need in a day. And then to find out the rate, you divide that by 24. So it is, it's quite nice, but realistically, you won't be giving this exact amount um, like written down prescribed. I remember one of the teaching fellows taught us that you can write the bag. So when you prescribe this, you'll probably prescribe this as um, either three 500 milliliters of ba bags of um, like whatever solution you're using. So sodium and then added dextrose or whatever, or a combination of um, two sodium, uh, two dextrose and one sodium. Um, but you, so you'd be, a, you'd be getting a total of 1.5 liters, even though this is the exact they need. But when you're writing the rate, you'd write that as 68 milliliters per hour. So what that means to like pediatric nurses basically is that you've got the right rate. So you still need to do all these calculations, um, but they'll figure out that when they set it at that rate, when they set the drip thing at that rate, um, they will obviously need to top up as well. Um, so the rate is the most important bit to calculate because that's specific to the weight of the child. The overall figure you get, that will probably have to be rounded up or rounded down when you prescribe it. But when you prescribe it, the rate is really important because that's the thing the nurses use um, to make sure that they're getting enough fluids. If that makes sense, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, now tackling the annoying bit. So a kid's coming to you, they have DKO, they are 27 kilos and they are dehydrated. And now you need to calculate, okay, so they need their maintenance fluids, but they also need some replacement fluids. So how much fluids do they actually need over 24 hours? So this is the equation you use. So it's weight times percentage dehydration times 10. So in, some, in many cases in an SBA, they will say um, like the exact percentage that they're dehydrated. So then it's really nice. But sometimes they'll just give you the signs for what level of dehydration they are. And you kind of have to figure out, OK, is this mild? Is this moderate? Is this severe? So there are th three categories, like I just said. And then if it's mild dehydration, that means they're less than 5% dehydrated. If you think the question is kind of suss out that they're like mildly dehydrated, then use 5% as your percentage dehydration number. If it's moder moderately dehydrated, um, it's between 5 to 10%. Now you can either use 7.5, which I have seen quite a few times, um, or you can go for like the worst case of dehydration, which is 10% and use that. And if they're severely dehydrated, normally the number will, will be there because you can't use, you can't just guess it's 10 because that's underestimating how de dehydrated they are. It'll probably be more than that. So how do you actually do this? I think the next slide, no, did it go for it? OK, so here, let's go through this first. So a child um, that is weighing 27 kilos, that is moderately dehydrated, how much replacement and maintenance fluids will they need? So we've already calculated the maintenance fluids to be um, 1640 milliliters per day. And now um, the replacement fluids is, well, they're 27 kilos. So that's weight times um, percentage dehydrated times 10 so it's 27 and let's take the higher boundary of 5 to 10 percent so let's take 10 percent so 27 times um uh 10 times 10 so that's 2700 milliliters per day so that's how much replacement fluids they need on top of their maintenance fluids so this kid is having a lot of fluids so then you'd add both of them up and then you divide by 24 to get you the rate. And that's how you calculate um, replacement fluids on top of maintenance fluids. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, if we just go back to the slide before. Um, so if someone is mildly dehydrated, that will kind of present a slightly dry mucous membranes, increased thirst, um, slightly decreased urine output, but they still will be going for a wee. Um, and it's normally managed orally um like with that or if they are nil by mouth then you can give like nasogastric rehydration solutions but it's normally managed at home 
Um, especially if you have a cause for it, then it's managed at home. If it's moderately dehydrated, then that's um, seen by clinical signs of like dry mucous membranes. Tachycardia is your most important sign here. Um, reduced urine output, that will also be quite obvious. Um, and it might be like they haven't gone for, to the toilet in like this many hours or whatever. Um, and then reduced skin turgor and sunken eyes. And in this case, they may need, they can maybe manage at home, again, if you know what the cause is, um, or they may need to come in for like an IV bolus. But obviously we want to limit how much kids come into the hospital. So keep that at the back of your mind. And then severe is the same as same signs as moderate, but like think, think septic, um, think like bad cap refill, mortal skin, cyanosis. Anytime you see any of this, I know you'd be so scared and therefore it's severe dehydration and they would need many IV bonuses probably and they would need lots of senior reviews. So yeah, that's how you categorize them. So, oh. okay, so we can do this question. You guys can click anything if you don't want to do the SBAs. It's like as a poll, it's fine. Okay. Okay, thanks for answering. Okay, so I thought this was actually a really hard question. I think it's taken from um the oh, a handbook. No, not the assess and progress. And you know those questions are quite hard. Um, but basically, what you kind of are looking for here is sorry my Ooh, okay the answer is actually c um and the reason for that is because if you go back to the question so it's a one-year-old boy he's had diarrhea he has vomited twice he's not passing urine for the past six hours he's thirsty and restless dry mucous membranes eyes sunken and um, skin tag have reduced his heart rate is on is high is high for him because I think 130 is about normal or the higher and higher end of normal and, and his is 160 and his cap refill is about two seconds so that's okay um so if you're looking at this what level of dehydration so I wouldn't say this is severe dehydration simply because he doesn't like his cap refill is is okay it's fine he does have other signs but I think um something that one of the pediatric like a and e specialist once told um us during teaching was that you can never use skin turgor as like a good sign in kids it's something to kind of keep your eyes out for and um, use like heart rate and like cap refill um is a, is a better sign um because for example he is tachycardic but he's not so severely tachycardic still in kids it's it, they their heart rate can go much higher um, so I don't think this would be a case of severe dehydration. I don't think it's mild either because he has not pot, like peed for the past six hours. So I don't think it's mild. So that leaves you with moderate. And then what to do? So I don't think D is actually the, like it's not that bad of an answer because he has vomited twice already and there's nothing telling you that he isn't vomiting currently. So in that case, if he's vomiting, then you know maybe it's best to give him IV um saline but it actually says oral because I think you have to trial um oral first um because you know the cause it sounds like gastroenteritis so you'd want to try oral first you want to try and keep the baby at home and then if really needs to be you'd bring them in um but it doesn't really make sense to bring kids in for just gastroenteritis unless they're like so severely dehydrated they can't tolerate any fluids um but that's not necessarily the case here but I do think it's a really hard question so well done for trying it okay and then moving on to the next SBO so we're kind of done with fluid stuff now and we're going on to hip really quickly
Okay. Um, I really don't like hip stuff. Don't really like anything also, but um the, the answer to this, thanks for thanks for um putting your answers in, guys. So the answer is um a vascular necrosis of the femur of the femoral head, sorry, not femur. Um and just to go through this. So this this stem is trying to get you to say it's Perth's disease. Um, so the first one, displacement of the F, of the femoral head, that's um, Sufi. Uh, you know what, let me just go to this slide because it explains it all. Okay, so these are all the hip conditions. Um, I, the only way I really learned them was categorizing them by like one key feature, um, which was really bad. But like Sufi, they normally always mention it's a boy that's obese um, and he's around the age of like 10 and 15. And that's like a big thing. And then um, I always remember that for the x-ray for Sufi, you also do like, a, you do a normal x-ray and you also do like a frog leg x-ray, which I think is really memorable because when else do you hear frog legs in medicine? Um, but yeah, so, and that's more for Sufi. And then Perfus disease. So this is um, commonly occurs between the ages of four to eight. And it's basically avascular necrosis. So because the femoral head has like posterior supply, blood supply, um, it can easily get affected. Um, and if there is necrosis of the femoral head, it basically kind of chips away at the, at the bone. And that's why you get a flattening of the femoral head on an X-ray. And it causes like progressive hip pain and stiffness. And then you get a reduced range of motion. Um, so weirdly, um, it's managed conservatively because it normally heals on its own. I don't I don't know because avascular ne necrosis is normally seen as such like a big thing but for this apparently I don't really know but um later on in life they may need like a total hip replacement which makes sense because if their like femoral head is getting flattened then it won't be able to work as well so that makes sense and then transient synovitis this is the most common reason why any kid um, comes in with hip problems, a &E. um, It occurs between the ages of about two and 10 and it's hip pain after a viral infection. And it's usually a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't need to do any tests for it, but if you're excluding stuff, you probably will end up doing like an X-ray just to make sure. And it's managed conservatively. And then septic arthritis, this is really no different to adults. Um, it's got basically the same signs, fever, irritability, refusal to bear weight, and like in adults, um, Staph aureus is the most common cause, at least I think. I think that's the most common cause, uh, unless in young people and old people. Yeah, it's different, right, for young and old people. But Staph aureus is the most common cause for kids and um, for septic arthritis. And then you can use this particular criteria, which I'll go through in the next slide, um, to kind of help guide you what you should do or how likely is it to be septic arthritis. And then just like in adults, you do like a sign of your fluid aspiration and you'd manage them with IV antibiotics followed by oral antibiotics and then drainage um, if it keeps reoccurring. And then um, bone cancers. So I think you only really need to learn like the malignant bone cancers and there's only two of them that ever come up. And if they come up, they come up with the signs that are seen on x-ray. So the osteosarcoma, normally that's associated with like the sunburst um, bone x-ray pattern. And then Ewing sarcoma is associated with like onion skin appearance. Um, and then it's managed like most cancers with chemo and um, surgical resection. But just remember with osteosarcoma, radiotherapy is like radiotherapy resistant. So you wouldn't really use it. And then juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So this always really confused me and I didn't really learn it properly. Um, but I think as far as I know, there are two big types of it. So one type is when there is um, arthritis in someone who is 16 or younger um, persisting for at least six weeks. Um, and the most common type, it normally affects like um, at least four joints. Um, no, it affects uh, up to four joints, yeah. It affects up to four joints and it's usually medium sized joints like elbows, knees, ankles. Um, and that's the most common type. And it's usually also associated with like a higher ANA on a blood test. And it's managed with like, like in adult arthritis with pain control and steroids. And in really severe cases, immunosuppressants can be used. 
And then you have Stills disease, which is like the systemic version of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, so that's associated with the characteristic salmon pink rash. It also has chronic uveitis. And um, actually the other GIA, the one that's associated with like four joints or less is also associated with anterior uveitis. So they're both similar in that sense. The biggest thing that differentiates them is the salmon, salmon pink rash in my head anyway and um, also in systemic uh, GIA or Stills disease. And um, normally like one joint is affected rather than like up to four. Um, and it's also associated with a higher ANA. And I think rheumatoid factor is also negative for that. And um, so something to kind of look out for. Um, but this is really niche stuff. They won't really ask you about this. The things that they love asking are Sufi and SBAs, pus disease and they love asking you to kind of like differentiate is it transient synovitis or is it septic arthritis um yeah and so this is a criteria that you can use for septic arthritis um so wait was i sharing the poll the whole time oh no okay this is the criteria you can use for septic arthritis so it's unable to bear weight, a temperature greater than 38.5, and then um, ESR greater than 40, um, and then white cell count greater than 12. So in most cases, you won't get ESR or white cell count, but if you do, then definitely use it. And as you can see, if, you're, um, if your score is like three or above, that's like a 90% chance that it is septic arthritis. So um, keep that at the back of your mind. Does this really help differentiate um, uh, what do you call it, septic arthritis and transient synovitis. Okay, moving on to the next question. Perfect, I won't keep you guys for too long. You got the right answer. So the answer is trisomy 21 and it's a non-disjunction anomaly causing trisomy 21 um so this what they're trying to say what is the diagnosis it's most likely down syndrome and that's associated with this genetic abnormality um so non-disjunction it usually happens on the maternal side it's when the chromosomes like the mum's chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis one and then translocation which happens less often as the cause of Down syndrome is when you have a third copy of chromosome 21 and it's transferred from another chromosome. Um, but so the most common one is non-disjunction. And um, this, the like trisomy 21 is also associated, like not associated with, but there are two other trisomies, trisomy 18 and 13 that you can get tested on as well. 18 causes Edwards and then 13 causes Patel's. And they are really like debilitating, like Patel's babies may only like survive a few hours. Some of them don't even survive um, till birth. And then Edward's babies survive like a few days, maybe a week or so. Um, but yeah, um, so it's a bit different to try um, to trisomy 21. But the way it can present and the way it can happen is similar to trisomy 21 in the sense of like non disjunction anomaly or like chromosomal translocation. So developmental de delay is like um, it's like a big topic. And then your eponymous syndromes, I think they're quite fun to learn because um, you can be quite like uh, you can you can come up with creative ways to kind of learn them. Um, and they do come up and they are really easy marks when they do come up. Um, so I would say do learn it. So these are the this is all you need for them, though. Like, don't bother going into more detail because this is all you'll ever need. Um, the ones that are highlighted are the ones that you see I love testing, especially Turner syndrome and co-optation of the aorta and the bicuspid aortic valve. They love that. Um, but all these other ones, I'd say I always just learn one really, like, obvious thing about them. Like, for example, um, Angleman's, I just learned that it was, like, happy personality or, like, Noonan's, I learned it was pulmonary stenosis. And that way... Um, I felt like I had like an image of what the rest of it could be, but it is kind of like rope learning. So I think, um, yeah, it's a bit annoying in that. Okay, so moving on to 
like pediatric cardiology. Um, so this is something that you don't necessarily need to know like exactly how fetal circulation happens, but I think fetal um, pediatric cardiology can be quite intimidating. Um, and if you know about what it, what you know is happening in the baby, then you're more likely to be able to tackle difficult questions on them and not just get confused when you've like rope learned it, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna try to explain things like as thoroughly as I can. And there's only two of you, so feel free to ask questions if you want. So fetal um, circulation. So in the fetus, gas exchange occurs through the placenta, not the lungs, as I'm sure both of you know. Um, oxygenated blood from the placenta goes via the umbilical vein um, to the ductus venosus, um, bypassing the liver. Um, and then it goes into the inferior vena cava. And then in the heart, the oxygenated blood is shunted from the right atrium to the left atrium through the foramen ovale. So that's essentially like a hole between the right atrium and the left atrium. And that's because the blood doesn't really need to go to the lungs because it's already oxygenated. Um, some of the blood will still go into the right ventricle and then to the pulmonary artery. But there's actually another shunt called the ductus arteriosus connecting the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So all the blood that has, you know, the little blood that has gone the other way, the long way around, will still event essentially get sent to the aorta and get like shipped out um, to the systemic circulation. Um, as for the majority of the blood, which has gone from the right atria to the left um, atria, it will then follow the normal path of going to the left ventricle and then the aorta and then to systemic circulation. So because of this really neat system um, and the fact that you don't really need to oxygenate the blood as a baby, um, in your own body. Um, congenital heart disease is kind of silent in fetal life because the placenta obviously provides the oxygen. But after birth, once the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus kind of close, that's when patients become symptomatic. Um, so in terms of like a, like P's cardio history, um, it's really, they're, re they're really sick babies. Most of the time, you you won't really be taking a history from them because you it's unlikely for you to kind of see them unless you're like at gosh um but they are quite they're very ill and most most of them um once they're born the problem's already detected and then you know they're taken straight to like um uh like ICU and stuff um but in some cases, when um, the congenital heart abnormality isn't as severe, it can present later on in life, like at a few weeks or months old, or even like um, when they're like five, six, like when they're older considerably. Um, so the way it can present uh, when they're younger more so is when they're irritable, there's decreased levels of activity. They often cry with feeds and there's often decreased feeding as well. And there's poor weight gain because of that. And they all they kind of have fast, regular breathing. And that's to do with like um, the way CO2 is kept in their body. And then sometimes um, over time, some issues can result in them becoming cyanotic. So that's why there are skin changes. Um, and in older children, it may present as like um, exercise intolerance. So for example, at PE, they struggle to do any exercise or um, chest pain and palpitations are also quite common and also syncope, um, so don't forget that. And then physical findings would be cyanosis, high respirate, increased work of breathing when they're a baby, um, high heart rate, murmurs, uh, pulmonary edema, so like heart failure signs, and then also fatigue as well. Okay, so going through acyanotic heart disease, so there's three main types I would say you should need to know. Um, there's ASD, so that's atrial septal defect, VSD, that's ventricular septal defect, and then PDA, that's um, patent ductus arteriosus. So first on ASD, so ASD, so there's a patent um, uh, foramen ovale. So that means the connection between the right atrium and the left atrium is still present and after birth. And it can kind of come up as um, clinical signs of like high respirate, poor weight gain, recurrent chest infections. And when you listen to the heart, you can hear a soft ejection systolic wide fixed split S2. So obviously that's a really big mouthful. So let me try and break that down for you guys. Um, so the reason why you have um, a split S2, 
So first of all, in S2, that's when your pulmonary valve and your aortic valve close. So um, the reason why it can be split is if one of either of these valves is closing after the other one. In this case, it's actually your pulmonary valve closing after your aort aortic valve. And that's why there's a split um, of, of the S2, because normally they both close at the same time. But in this case, the pulmonary is closing after the aorta and therefore it splits them up. And then the reason why it's fixed um, and why, wide and fixed is because of the fact that it doesn't change, um, like the splitting of the valves um, and when they close doesn't change based on inspiration or expiration. And I'll explain the reasonings for that. And the reason why it's ejection systolic is because normally any um, kind of murmur coming from um, the pulmonary valve or the aortic valve will always be ejection systolic. Like you can remember that with aortic stenosis, it's an ejection systolic um, murmur. And then I'll explain the soft bit at the end. So the reason why you have a wide fixed split is because of the fact that during um, inspiration, you have an increased venous return to the right side of the heart. This means there's more blood um, in the right atrium and then more blood means that there's more, um, more blood going through the right ventricle and up through the pulmonary artery. And that means that the pressure in the right atrium is higher. Um, in the right chamber, sorry, is just higher overall. And that means it takes a longer time basically for the pulmonary artery to kind of push out all this blood. And therefore it closes a bit later than the aortic valve. Sorry, it, um, the pulmonary valve closes a bit later than the aortic valve because it has more blood to kind of push out through the valve. And that's the reason why um, it closes, there's a split S2 during inspiration. During expiration, what happens is that um, your venous return to the right side of your heart is lower, like there's less venous return on the right side of the heart. That means that the pressure in the right side of the heart will be less because there's less blood in the right side of the heart, and especially in the right atrium. And that would mean that the pressure in the left atrium would be greater than the pressure in the right atrium. So the blood from the left atrium would be like, yeah, we can go through the foramen ovale because that's patent. And we can go into the, um, yeah, so the blood from the left atrium will go into the right atrium. And therefore now again, there's a case of more blood on the right side of the heart. So more blood going from the right atrium to the right ventricle and up through the pulmonary artery. So again, it means that the pulmonary valve will be closing later um, during expiration as well than the aortic valve. So that's the reason you have a wide fixed split S2. Um, and the reason why it's soft is because it's easier to think about this when, for example, during pulmonary hypertension, you have like a rapid click noise and it's like a hard noise, um, not necessarily soft. Um, so it's like the opposite. And the reason you have that is because the pressure in the pulmonary system is really high because there's pulmonary hypertension. So that means that there's a bigger difference between the pulmonary system pressure and the system in the right chamber. So the valve, which is kind of like a door between both these systems, shuts a lot quicker. If you think about like a room and like wind, there's more wind on one side than the other side, the door will shut really quickly. But in, case, in a case like this, when the pressure in the right system is still quite, is higher than it normally would be because of all these um, reasons giving the right system more blood, it would mean that the pressure's more equalized. It's not necessarily equal, but it's more similar. And therefore, if for example, the wind is the same in both side, in both rooms, then the door between those rooms will close a lot more softly. So that's the best way to kind of remember that. I hope that helps because I know these things are kind of annoying to remember. So I hope that helps you guys. And then in terms of investigations, you'd wanna do an ECG and an echo. And in terms of the management, so if the ASD is less than five millimeters, you manage it conservatively. And in many cases, it kind of closes over time as well as pressures change. Um, and if it's greater than one centimeter, you'd want to close it by a transcatheter closure. So that's usually done by pediatric interventional radiologists or open heart surgery, which is done by pediatric uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. And then you have VSD. So this is the most common congenital um, uh, congenital heart disease. And the 
the most important thing to remember for this, because I love testing, um, especially on PassMed, is that the bigger the VSD is, essentially the bigger the hole is between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. That means um, like the more severe the VSD is, but actually the, the quieter the murmur will sound or the VSD will sound. And that's because there's just more blood going through the space. So if, if conversely, the VSD was really small and it was going through a smaller gap, then the blood rushing through it would sound like a higher pitch. Um, so that's the that's a good way to remember, I think. Um, so VSD kind of presents with heart failure symptoms. So for example, in most cases, the pressure in your left ventricle will be higher than the pressure in your right ventricle. Therefore, blood will be kind of moving from left to right ventricle um, down the pressure gradient through the patent VSD. And then as the blood is moving in the right ventricle, it will kind of co cause like a backflow of blood back into like, you know, through like through um, the um, like the liver, for example. That's why you can have signs of um, heart failure like hepatomegaly or um, signs of swelling in the feet as well. So that's what happens in a normal VSD. But over time, um, what happens if, if when treatment like starts to get delayed, um, you can have something called something called Eisenmenger syndrome, which is essentially when any asynotic heart disease turns into a synotic heart disease. And the reason why that can happen is because over time you have these symptoms of heart failure. So that means that the systemic circulation pressure is gonna be higher. So the aorta is gonna have to work harder. And that will eventually mean that at one point, um, uh, there's going to be um, such a big shunt from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. Um, sorry, that's going to mean that eventually blood is going to go um, from the, yeah, from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart, which eventually means that, um, actually, no, let me not describe it like that because it can get confusing. If you look at the bottom here, it says uncorrected, um, left or right shunting over time causes um, like heart failure signs, which I've explained, and it can cause pulmonary hypertension, which is something that happens even in adults with heart failure. So now the right side of the heart will also have like a really like high pressure system to work against. So now the blood will shift from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart because the right side of the heart suddenly becomes a high pressure system. On one side of it, there's pulmonary hypertension where it needs to go to. And the other side where it's come from, there's like a backlog of blood and which causes the heart failure signs. So then the right side of the heart is a really high pressure system. So blood will go the other way this time from um, right to left. And that can cause cyanosis because it means that um, the blood hasn't been oxygenated and it's traveling around the body. Um, so that's called Eisenmenger syndrome. So it's when an asynotic heart disease turns into a synotic heart disease. And then um, VSD in terms of the sound is described as a pansystolic murmur. And that's because it occurs through the whole of systole, like blood can pass from the, so as blood goes, as blood is sitting in the left ventricle um, in a, like a, a patient who doesn't have as severe a VSD, let's just think about it like that. Um, as it's being pushed through the aorta, it can also go into the right ventricle because there's a patent um, VSD. And that would mean that it's like a continuous systolic murmur because it's happening during systole. And then it's investigated with an echo and the management is with heart failure drugs. Um, and in larger VSDs, it can be managed surgically. So with a hybrid approach. So well, that's when they use like um, both interventional radiology and open heart. Um, surgery approaches and then PDA so that's patent ductus arteriosus so that's when the hole between the um, pulmonary artery and the uh, aorta doesn't close so normally it closes right after birth like within the first few breaths um, because of different pressures however in some people it doesn't close and it can cause something called a subclavian thrill and that's because the murmur kind of radiates to the left side of the sternum and the artery there feels it and you can feel like a thrill I mean I've never felt it but I'm just saying um supposedly that's what happens and then it's caused like a continuous machinery murmur because 
the blood can go from the aorta, which is a much higher pressure system than the pulmonary artery. Um, it can go from the aorta to pulmonary artery like any time. So it's just continuous. And it's often described as a machinery murmur. It's normally quite aggressive sounding. I do think it's quite obvious. Um, and then a bounding collapsing pulse because normally the diastolic pressure is a lot lower than it would be for a normal person, which is why you also have a wide pulse pressure. Um, and it also means that the pulse will kind of compensate for a low diastolic pressure by um, being really like bounding and sharp. And you can also have a heaving apex beat eventually as well. So it's investigated with an echo and normally a PDA, um, what is supposed to close it is NSAIDs. So NSAIDs kind of inhibit the action of prostaglandins and um, NSAIDs manage to close this connection because prostaglandins kind of keep this connection open. So NSAIDs inhibit this and um, they close this connection. So um, the baby can kind of carry on <laughs> and live their life. But yeah, so NSAIDs inhibit the action of prostaglandins and prostaglandins normally keep the PDA open. And at birth, there is supposed to be a production of like anti-prostaglandins, but in some people that doesn't happen, which is why the PDA kind of remains open as well. And something important to know, AVSD is um, common in about 40% of those with Down syndrome. So that's when they have um, an atrial and a ventricular septal defect. Um, so it's like an important fact to remember. And then that second point, so if Isenmenger does eventually occur and a cyanotic, asynotic heart disease, has turned cyanotic, um, it would eventually need to be fixed with like a heart and lung transplantation as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so cyanotic heart disease is only really two you need to know. The first one's to talk to trilogy of fellow. So that's a combination of four things. So we've kind of already spoken about stuff like this before, but it's a VSD and um, that and pulmonary stenosis and right ventricular heart right ventricular hypertrophy, and then finally an overriding aorta. So it's a combination of all these four things. Um, so a VSD is what essentially causes the cyanosis. So in Tetralogy of Fallot, because there is such high, um, because there is pulmonary stenosis, a lot of the blood from the right side of the heart can't get out. And that increases the pressure in the right side of the heart. And that means that a lot of blood goes from right to left. And it means that a lot of it isn't oxygenated and because it hasn't gone to the pulmonary system yet. And then because it's already gone to the left side of the heart, it'll end up going to the rest of the body without any oxygen attached to it. And it can present as like cyanosis in a child. And then pulmonary stenosis. So this is when there's like thickening of the pulmonary valve and it can be either above the valve or actually valvular. In most cases, I think it's not actually at the valve. Um, but essentially what it causes is it causes right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So it's it's basically when the path of the right ventricle um, for the blood to flow out the right ventricle is kind of very narrow. Um, and we'll speak about tet, cell, tet spells in a bit. And then because of all this like high pressure system on the right side of the heart, like um, the pulmonary stenosis with the right ventricular um, outflow obstruction, it causes um, the right side of the heart to work even harder, and that causes hypertrophy of the right side of the heart, um, which gives it its characteristic like boot-shaped sign on a chest x-ray. And then finally, an overriding aorta, it just means that in a lot of cases of tetralogy, if below the aorta is placed a bit anteriorly, and it just changes things for it. It's not as significant as the others in terms of giving it clinical the clinical features it gives children, but it is um, one of the four characteristics of Tetralogy of Fallot. So like I said, cyanosis, which is kind of explained by VSD, um, is one of the clinical features, another one being respiratory distress, and then TET spells. Um, so this is characterized by high respirate, and then cyanosis, which can lead to loss of consciousness, and it's triggered by irritability, fever, and pain. So to really explain TET spells, so because um, you've got this issue, in um, the heart of someone who has tetralogy of fellow where blood is going from the right side to the left side and it's not getting oxygenated and the rest of your system is going to have like cyanotic issues so it's not it's going to have a buildup of carbon dioxide and that means that your like um, centers in the brain um, that like uh, activate your breathing is going to pick up this high carbon dioxide and cause like deep inspiration um, and deep breaths basically. 
which is a deep rapid breaths, which is why you get tachy um, tachypnea. But um, when you have, when you deeply inspire, it also increases the venous return to the right side of your heart. So that means that this whole cycle of the right side of the heart getting more blood and having more pressure just carries on and just continues, which is why it's really um, fatal diagnosis if it's not dealt with correctly. So that explains tet spells. And the reason why you actually have the spell, so what happens is that a child is triggered either by fever, pain, cry, like irritability, crying, whatever it is, and it essentially increases its heart rate. And that, um, that deep, rapid breathing that it has um, further worsens the already right to left shunting that's happening and causing the cyanosis. And then eventually when it is that distressed, it will um, appear blue and like its fingers and its face can go blue. Um, and then it can, it does resolve, but that that's what a tet spell is basically. Um, and in terms of his investigations, ECG, chest X-ray would show the boot sign and then echo, which would actually sort of show what is going on. And then it's managed um, like with a lot of cyanotic heart disease, it's immediately managed with giving prostaglandin infusion to keep the PDA open at birth. And that's done so that they can kind of keep the baby functioning and alive until surgery is kind of a plan is decided on when to do surgery and when to um kind of fix the whole issue properly and um, so surgery is normally done between three to four months and they basically correct or try to correct as many of those abnormalities that have happened um, structurally to the heart and then transposition of the great artery so that's when the aorta comes of the comes out of the right ventricle um, so as you can see here the aorta in the picture aorta comes out of the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk comes out of the left ventricle so basically the blood which is deoxygenated has come back from the body into the right ventricle and then it goes to the aorta to then go to the body again. So the body keeps circulating deoxygenated blood. And on the left side of the heart, um, the blood comes from the lung oxygenated um, in the hope to go to the body oxygenated, but it ends up just going back to the lungs and like, and the cycle just repeats. So it's got its two loops that kind of just go about and do the same thing, but they don't actually intersect like they should. And obviously you'd have cyanosis because nowhere is getting any oxygen um, and you'd have um, tachypnea and a loud S2. And I'm guessing that's because of like pulmonary pressures being high as well and same with aortic pressures, but I'm not exactly sure. And um, you'd also have a right ventricular heave because the right side of the heart has to work very hard um, to uh, like work against the aorta as well. Um, which has higher pressures. That's what I'm guessing, but I'm not really sure about that. And then in terms of the investigations, you'd want to do an echo, you'd want to do a chest X-ray that would show you an egg on a string sign. I don't really, I don't really get it, but it is a bit, it looks very different from a normal heart. And then like with Tetralogy of Fallot, you'd manage it by giving prostaglandins to keep the PDA open. And then you do something called an arterial switch operation, usually between before four weeks. And then these are some of the low yield um, cyanotic congenital heart disease um, conditions. You don't need to know this. Um, I think that the only ones you really need to know are the, the two that I've spoken about, but they are interesting. Okay, this is the last SBA. Okay, thanks for voting. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, so the answer is actually D. I think this is really hard. Um, so basically, you just need to know the guidelines for this, and the guidelines are really tedious to remember. But they do question about seat, like head injuries quite a bit, and it is really important both in adults and in children. Um, so what really tells you here? So it's kind of categorized into a high risk feature. Um, so let me first go through this and then we can go back to the question. So this is you'd need to do a CT head with a, within an hour if you have any suspicion of a non-accidental injury um, or if it was a post-trauma seizure um, only 
if they had that seizure and they don't have a background of epilepsy, then you'd want to investigate and do a CT head within an hour. If they have a background of epilepsy, then the post-traumatic seizure isn't really um, an important point. If their GCS is less than 14 um, at presentation, and if their GCS is less than 15 at two hours, if they have a suspected open skull or um, depressed skull fracture, so that's the same as adults, you do a CT head within an hour, or a sign of a basal skull fracture, same as adults again. And then focal neurological def deficit, you do an hour within a CT head as well, um, same as adults, I think. And then if they're less than one years old or they have swelling or a laceration of greater than five centimeters, and then these are your other kind of, you'd consider a CT head if you had, no, you do a CT head only if you had more than one of these signs. So loss of consciousness for greater than five minutes, abnormal drowsiness, three or more episodes of vomiting. I think in adults it's two, um, but we'll see on the next slide. And then dangerous mechanism of um, injury. So if it's like fall from a height greater than three centimeters or a, like a high speed injury or like, a road traffic accident, and then amnesia for greater than five minutes. And if you only have one of these features, then you just absorb, observe them four hours and then do a CT head um, within an hour if observed and the GCS is less than 15 or you have further episodes of vomiting. Now, if you go back to the question, this three-year-old, um, he, he presented two hours after the injury already. Um, he'd lost consciousness for 10 minutes, so that is greater than five minutes. Um, so if he has one other sign, um, then we can do CT head within an hour. He has vomited, but he's only vomited twice, um, and he needs to vomit three times. Um, and there have been no other episodes of drowsiness or loss of consciousness. So in this case, you'd observe the child for four hours, and then you would um, like look at GCS again, or if he has any other further episodes of vomiting. And if he doesn't, then you can discharge him home and safety net him. Um, but if he does, then you do a CT head within an hour, if that makes sense. And then this is how it compares to adult guidelines. Um, you guys can kind of look at it, this in your own time. Um, and then, oh yeah, why is this not admit for child protection? So um, a three-year-old child is brought into any after falling off a chair and hitting their head. So a three-year-old child, yeah, I can imagine that happening. Three year olds are very adventurous and I can imagine them sitting on a chair. They are able to get to a chair by themselves uh, as well. And they can also like fall off. The, when I would start suspecting um, child protection assessment is when they're, they're doing something and the development at that age doesn't match up. So, for example, if they were one years old and they um, or like six months old and they fell down the stairs because the mum said, oh, they were like walking down the stairs and they fell. I'd be like, that doesn't make sense because most six months old can't walk. They can crawl. Um, but like you'd look out for signs like that. It'd be quite obvious if it was admit for child protection anyway, because it'd be a really young age and they would have quite a they'd be. Um, the mum would say or the parent would say that they're doing quite an advanced um, development thing which most kids don't do at their age so then you'd be like okay something's not adding up and that's when you'd want to admit them for child protection assessment um, so I hope that helps um, kind of figure out why it's not that but it's really good you thought about it it should always be at the back of your mind um, because it's really important and it can often be missed um, so yeah uh, and then this is just GCS and children I don't think it's that different. I don't, like it is if they're under five, but I don't think you'd be asked to really calculate this. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. If there's any questions, otherwise this is the feedback form. Thank you so much for staying. I really appreciate it. Thank you.